Scouts, and welcome to another episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness. I am your host, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host, Bryce Johnson, and our super producer, Riley Bray. Oh, it's a scorcher, boys. <laughs> I hope everybody's staying safe in this heat because I sat down to record this episode and I'm already sweating my balls off. Um, <laughs> yep. it's, I've just boy, accepted it's that I'm just a little bit sweaty all the time now. Maybe <laughs> maybe forever. Yeah, you know? probably forever and ever. Uh, if you're listening on the West Coast and you're dealing with all this massive heat wave, we hope you're doing well. Uh, find some place cool to sit and uh, we'll keep you company for the next uh, you know hour or so. Um, boys, Bryce, big announcement on the social medias today. Yeah. We can say it. Why don't you say it? Yeah, it's official. Uh, season three of Expedition Bigfoot is underway. We got a pickup. Congratulations. Yeah. I was sipping water and I couldn't say congrats. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, it looks like filming has started. I know you can't tell us anything. Can you tell us if production is underway? Yes, production is underway. So... Um, I know it's always so funny. It's like, like two months ago, I'm like, Hey, I need more of your Bigfoot stories for a secret project. <laughs> we've, we've been around that block before, but it's, it's, it's hard keeping the word mom and playing coy, but it's nice to be able to officially, uh, let our fans know that we'll be back. So I'm really excited about it. I, I love this gig. I love the people I work with and the fans are great. And it's just, it's a blast, man. I mean, you know, I'm going to ask you. You know, for those of the, for everybody who listened to our Patreon series where we covered every episode of the show uh, last season, I, I'm you know I got to ask you for a little tease. What do you got? You got something for me, for us already, don't you? <laughs> Man, I'm gonna keep mom. Uh, I have nothing to say except it's it's gonna be fucking fantastic. Uh, as much as I don't want to, let me go turn off my air conditioner. All right, it's on well, an energy saver. Stand While Bry- Bryce is doing that and uh, being lame, uh, yeah. Club Scouts... It's about as much information yeah. as that uh, this UFO sucks. report. This sucks, guys. Like, we should be getting the <laughs> scoops, and he won't tell us a goddamn thing. Uh, Club Scouts... All right. You can support the show by subscribing to our Patreon, BCC, The Other Side, for five bucks a month. You get a three you get three to five bonus episodes every month that you can listen to from our Patreon homepage or on your favorite podcast app, just like how you're listening to this right now. The other side is the parallel dimension of the Bigfoot Collectors Club with full-length episodes you can only listen to exclusively when you join the Patreon at patreon.com slash Bigfoot Collectors Club. And if you just want to put a small tip in the Bigfoot jar. You can do so over buymeacoffee.com, the link to which you can find in our link tree and our Instagram and Bigfoot Collectors Club, uh, at Bigfoot Collectors Club, and on our Twitter, at Bigfoot Pod. And finally, you can always support the show by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you do, we might read it on the air, like this one that Bryce is going to read for you right now. Nostalgic, hilarious, mystical, and weird. Five stars. You boys are so much fun together. Every time I listen, I feel like I'm hanging out with friends. Perfect blend of paranormal and laughs. My dream is to hang out with you at the clubhouse. This podcast and their amazing Patreon has helped my mental health and emotional stability so much hearts. Thank you so much. I love hearing that. That's so nice. That's fantastic. And you know and you what? Know what? For- it's helped my mental health and emotional stability <laughs> I'm gonna say mine too. as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say it's a, little, it's a little up and down for me, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, for the most part, yes. But uh, when we're knee deep in wet, hot alien summer two summer abduction, like we yeah. are right now. I failed to mention that, everybody. Uh, I'm I'm like I am starting to like 
like the night terrors are starting to creep in a little bit. Uh, guys, That's... help me help keep those night terrors away, listeners. Give us a five star review. If we get 1,000 five star reviews, we will record the BCC Jet Ski special. We are currently at 736. We just need you guys to cross those last few hundred. And if we get 1,000 Patreon subscribers before the end of the summer, Bryce will ride one of those jet skis naked. So you know what to do, Club <laughs> Scouts. Your summer depends on it. Okay. Sounded so much better the first time we said it. Now, now it just feels weird. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But still true. <laughs> so. Still true. Still weird. Always will <laughs> be. man of his word. <laughs> Speaking of weird, uh, yes. in, a different, in a different way, in a much more fun way, uh, our guest tonight is one of the best known investigators of UFO, paranormal, and occult phenomena in America. He's an author, researcher, podcaster, producer, director, and yes, even actor. A real renaissance weirdo. Please welcome back to the clubhouse. Mr. John E. L. Tenney. Woo! All right. Hey guys, what's going on? What's oh, going on, John? Oh, what? You know, just keep keeping it weird. Wet, hot, alien summer. What? <laughs> what was? What's more haunted? The last haunted house you went to, or the first three minutes of this episode? Uh, the idea of Bryce naked on jet ski will haunt me for the rest of my life. So. Good. Good. Our work is done then. <laughs> John, how's it? How have you been, man? I think the last time we spoke to you here in the clubhouse was, I believe, around this time last summer during Wet Hot Alien Summer, the 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 first. Um, I want to catch up on what you've been up to in the past year. Maybe we can kick things off with you were talking about researching a uh, a, a phenomena phenomenon in i believe it's michigan where you're based oh, I called the formanots yeah yeah what? so i started researching i got a a weird case uh, in 2018 of some people who had seen something strange a strange creature in their neighborhood and so i went out and talked to them and then do what i do which is walk around the neighborhood and knock on doors and ask anybody if they've seen anything weird i think that's the hardest part of my job right is oh. to cold cold call people on their strangeness <laughs> <laughs> and over the course of about a year and a half, I found that we had had in Michigan some type of wave of strange creatures, which I was calling formanauts, still calling them formanauts. Uh, but it was everything from weird looking robotic aliens with like aquarium fish tank heads to giant furry floating boxes that moved through trees and cars to uh, little uh, triangles that ran around on the ground. It was absolutely, it's still absolutely bizarre. And so I've just been writing about that and trying to put together all of the different information of like what time of night they happened, what days they happened, what the moon phases were, uh, the age of the people, like everything and trying to find some, something that would maybe give me any idea of what was happening. Wow, that is psychedelic. Can Have you gotten Seriously. any closer to a, a working theory? And can you tell us again why you call them the Formanauts? Yeah, so I was originally in my handwritten notes with the first case, I, I just kept writing humanoid creature. And then when I stumbled onto like the second case, it wasn't humanoid. It was this like three foot by three foot box that seemed to be covered in hair with some lights inside of it that passed through a tree and a fence and was seen by a couple of people. I'm like, well, that's not a humanoid. I can't call these humanoids anymore. And then I started wondering, like, if this is the same creature that's just taking different forms, mm. then then it's a form and not. It's sailing through forms. It's it's taking a form that's specific and individualized to each experience, or if it's the same thing. Killer. That's a great name too. Hey, I, I love, love it. that term. Yeah. This sounds. Uh, yeah, go on, John. Was super, Sorry. I was just going to say it was super crazy because, you know, when when you're talking, when I'm talking to, to people like the, the black triangles that were on the ground that people saw running around, you know, I was in this neighborhood and I was asking people going door to door and saying, like, you know, have you seen anything weird? This is my name. Here's my card. You know, I'm not bothering you. Don't, don't want to bother you. And, you know, I had this first report of this black triangle that was illuminated on top and it was supposedly running through this neighborhood. 
Yep. And I was talking to this one gentleman about three blocks away. And he said, no, I haven't really seen anything weird except, you know, last week on, on this certain day, which was the day that this triangle got spotted running around. He said, uh, I saw this weird thing. It was like a black cat with, with birthday candles on it running around. <laughs> what? And I was like, I was like, uh, it was a black cat. And he's like, well, yeah, it was like real low to the ground, like a black cat and it had little birthday candles on it. And, and I'm thinking to myself like, oh, he saw this same thing, but doesn't have any frame of reference. Like in his mind, it, it must have been a black cat running around right. with birthday candles on it. And then in my brain, I'm laughing because I'm like, that's even stranger to me than a black triangle with lights on it running around. That is that, a trip. That's fucking insane. That's great. What? So how does a black triangle? So, you know, when you say black triangles, I'm thinking of the, the big UFO ships. This is obviously something different. This is like this. This sounds like something out of Alice in Wonderland, like little fractal patterns, like r- running around on two legs or are yeah, they so the, stick legs? Yeah. What, are, what are they running? Yeah, around so on? The original witness to this strange formanaut type thing uh, described it as maybe about four inches thick. And about a foot and a half uh, wide as a triangle. And it had three little legs underneath it. And it had these little illuminated lights on the top. And it was running down the street and under cars. And then he watched it move up a fence and then kind of float down from the fence. He said it, 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 after, as it came over the fence, it descended slowly and then took off running again. This is like we're all living in some weird like Pixar movie that we don't know that we're we're just yeah. humans in a Pixar movie that are there to react to whatever little fantasy creature is like having a, a chase sequence. You know what I mean? Like we yeah. don't you think that maybe that they're the real stars of the show and yeah. we're just here uh, to, yeah. to like a wow and swerve a car. <laughs> yeah, so that little triangle can like learn about the importance of being itself. That that's why we're really here. I, I mean, I have a question. I mean, it feels so something like that feels so fresh and new and I've never heard or read anything about that. Does that does that change your approach to your investigation or you know, cuz it it doesn't seem like old hat and there's not a lot of theories that have been floated around about it. So, do you like when something like this happens? It feels you know, all your own, really. I mean, like you get to sort of uh, come to bring this to people's minds and attentions and, and, and sort of get a grasp on it yourself before anyone else. What, what is that like? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because the way that I research stuff and the, and the things that I'm fascinated with, what what ends up happening is I get that initial excitement of like, oh, I'm I'm going to be the first person that kind of is involved with this thing. And then as I start researching, like, giant floating furry boxes. <laughs> like I find cases from the thirties and the fifties where oh, people saw wow. floating boxes. And I'm like, Oh, I'm, this is just happened before. It's just being noticed again now. So wow. Like all of this stuff seems crazy and new to me, but also in the back of my mind is like, okay, research this because it probably happened to someone else some other time. And yeah. You were right. It did. That's I incredible. Remember, I remember, uh, John, I, when I was doing uh, research for the Enfield Monster, I found this article. I'm pulling it up now from the Republic Times, St. Louis. Uh, this is from 2017. I think I sent this to you, um, but there was a there was a UFO story uh, in the 60s. Uh, I'm pulling it up here. Uh, once there, the team. Okay, uh, hometown of Fairfield. Uh, one such sighting occurred on August 4th of 1963. The story tell, uh, involves two teenagers on their way back from a drive-in movie being chased by what seemed to be a UFO. The story tells of the object speeding up as the car sped up, chasing them all the way to the girlfriend's house. Once there, the teenagers went inside the house, turned out the lights, and watched through the window as a lit-up, fuzzy object about the size of a wash tub hovered outside the house as the teenagers watched from inside the house a sister of the girlfriend was also witness to the unexplained happening and I, just reading that wash tub size fuzzy ufo that lit up from the inside i was like this sounds like one of those formanaut things that john yeah. investigated yeah it's su- yeah it's super crazy and they and this is the other thing that drives me nuts too because i do love to try and think as weirdly as possible about this stuff 
is as a researcher who loves weird stuff, I imagine myself to be pretty well informed with the strange cases. But then I have like these giant furry boxes and I've never heard of them before. And then I start researching and people like you send me cases that are similar to it. And I'm like, oh, did these cases even exist in the past before it happened now? Like, is it retro causality? Like, does right. it happen in the future? And then it bounces itself backwards? Because why didn't I find these stories in the past before? Hmm. Yeah, I like that. Oh. Yeah, we t- I think yeah. we touched upon that. When we were chatting about like cases like the Mothman and stuff where it's like maybe this stuff does work its way backward through time like it anchors itself in the future and then ripples or or in the present and then ripples forward and backward down the timeline well just the idea that the past is malleable you know what i mean i love i love that that it's not set in stone that it as well can still change i mean the future certainly isn't set but maybe neither is the past or something can engage the timeline outside of the timeline like if you're playing the piano right okay this might hey guys this might actually work as a metaphor but if you're playing the piano (laughs) let's say that um you you know you got two hands on the keyboard say say the left of the keyboard is like 1920 and the right of the keyboard is 2021 you know what i mean but you're playing it at the same time you know what i mean so Mm. you can so whoever's engaging with it is playing two different years simultaneously right and they may not have done it at any point until they did like the formanauts may not have decided to pick up and play the piano until now. And so they're entering our time stream in the present and in the sixties or some other time period, or, you know, you know what I mean? That kind of works. Yeah, right? That works as a metaphor, right? I, now, did it. I want to know more about who's playing this piano and what he's yeah, sitting on. Piano. And is he wearing yeah. fuzzy, fuzzy underwear? A, a, definitely has like a sick robe and like hair. Just like oh, you know he's got wind. a sick robe. Yeah, yeah, definitely some kind of space wizard. Yeah, yes, he's got a high collar. Yeah. It's just, it's just John. It's just the Elton John. That's it's just literally Elton John. Um, so what do you? I mean, what is your takeaway with this stuff right now? Like, where are you at? Like Bryce said, where are you at with that case? And then what other stuff have you been looking into? Uh, recently yeah so so I'm just finishing up trying to I mean it's not really going to be a book I mean it'll maybe be a 150 pages or something but it's mostly just like charts and graphs of like the time it happened and what people saw and I've had all of the witnesses do their own sketches of what they saw and then I I either sat with them or one of my friends who's a professional artist sat with them and drew what they saw so you get the witness sketch and like a more professional sketch of what they saw um, so hopefully that'll be done by Christmas. I'm, I'm really kind of hoping to get that done. You know, obviously the pandemic put the kibosh on a lot of stuff, right. but, uh, yeah, I mean, aside from that, it's just been like jumping hard into like working on cases that are coming up around, like a lot of ghost stuff happened during the pandemic just because people were in their houses mm-hmm. and, you know, most people aren't awake and aware inside of their houses as much as they have been for the past year and a half. And so they started noticing all of the weird shit that's probably always going on, but they're just noticing it for the first time. Yeah. I remember reading that. I think it was a, I want to say New York times article, but I I might be mistaken, but somebody reported on, on the, uh, you know, upflux of activity of, of, of ghost like sightings and, and, and wrappings in their home while being stuck inside. Yeah, that was me. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, there you go. With, that's when you're the OG source right there. No, it was literally just him hiding in a wall and knocking on it. He's just, John's just been living in people's walls during the pandemic. That's what he's. I'm trying to keep myself busy, you know. Yeah. Um, what, where do you think, uh, time of day wise, I think we've chatted a little bit about this before. I know John Keel was like, Wednesdays at such and such, you know, time is a good time to see UFOs. Has there ever been a place or, or a time for you that you're like, oh, if I go here, I know something's going to happen. Or uh, this time of day, I always experience a synchronicity of some kind. There was, uh, I was just talking to someone about this earlier today, but there was a house in Hamtramck, Michigan, which is about seven miles away from where I, I live. And I had access to it. It was abandoned house and it had some stories about ghosties in it or whatever. And I asked the owner if I could investigate. He said, yeah. 
And like I said, it was abandoned property. And he pretty much gave me the keys to it and said, you know, go in whenever you want. And so I spent a couple years uh, going there, staying there overnight, weeks on end, trying to like categorize and classify when weird sounds would happen, when weird feelings would happen. And after like two years, I really did narrow it down to like, you know, the on Thursday nights between one and one thirty, like there's going to be a weird thing that happens. Mm. Like it just, just happens. This is the the pattern that this house seems to be on. And I took people there at, at that time and told them like, this is what's going to happen. Like you're going to hear this sound and we're not going to know where it comes from. You're going to hear this voice, no idea who's speaking. And it was, it really freaked me out. And it got to the point where I was like, okay, now after two and a half years, I want to bring scientists into this. And so I contacted like University of Michigan and talked to some people there at Wayne State, the colleges around town and started putting everything together. And as if on cue, it's just outside of Detroit, someone burned the house down. Hmm. You're kidding me. Whoa. And that has always really... It still to this day breaks my heart. There's a, another house in Indian Village in Detroit. You talk about strange cases. Um, this husband and wife moved into this turn of the century arts and crafts kind of mission home in Indian Village. And there was a dining room table in the, the kind of setting dining room. And the dining room table was this giant oak table. And the room had been built around the table. Like you couldn't get the table out of the room. There were no doors big enough. And it was this solid hulking piece of oak. And the people called me in because pencils were falling out from underneath the table. So I went to the house and there's a pencil under the table. They show me, they're like, okay, there's the pencil. And they took the pencil out from under the table. And I'm like, okay, so what's the What's the situation? And do, you mean like, like, well, do you mean like materializing out of nowhere, like a porting pencils? Y- yes. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> and so I said, I, I took the pencil and I'm like, so what's the deal? And they're like, well, you have to leave the room. Nobody can be looking. And so we turned around and literally took two steps. None of us looking. And I hear a pencil hit the ground. I look <laughs> under the table and there's a pencil. It's a different pencil, but I'm still holding the one I took, you know? So I take it and I'm looking under the table, I'm laying on the floor, I'm pressing up against the table, like with my hands, trying to find like secret drawers. How are these people fooling me? Like what's going on? And I stand up and I started to walk toward them. They were in the living room. And as soon as I stood up and and was facing them, I hear a pencil hit the floor. And I look back and there's another pencil on the table. And I'm like, how long has this been going on? They're like, "It, it always goes on. Like we usually just leave the pencil there because it gets really annoying. And I go in their kitchen, they have cups and glasses full of pencils. Uh, <laughs> can you describe new- the pencils? Whoa. Are they just like standard number twos or? Everything that you can imagine. Pencils from the turn of the century. Pencils, you know, that are semi-plastic and kind of wood. Those ones that you can what? kind of bend. Some are, some are sharpened down to nubs. Some are brand new. Some of the erasers are like wow. every pencil that you this can imagine. This is where all of our pencils go when we lose our <laughs> <Yeah>. pencils. <laughs> That right. was my idea. I was like, this is when people lose pencils, they fall under this table. Like right. <laughs> no other explanation for it. So we moved, like I moved the table around the room. I put cameras on it. If anybody or anything was watching the table, it wouldn't drop a pencil. Wow. As soon as you turned the cameras off and turned away, you'd hear the pencil hit the floor. And I was like super excited. And again, this was a few years after that house in Hamtramck. So I go back, I find more professors at University of Michigan, Michigan State University, Wayne State, uh, Schoolcraft College. And I, I'm like, OK, I need you guys to come and see this. This is paranormal phenomena. It's and it's reproducible. It's happening like all the time. So uh, and what are they I saying? Talk- <laughs> well, I started talking. I have enough pull and and I have enough friends that are in right. enough colleges to where I can I can get some people to go. Well, he's not totally nuts. Let let's go see what he's talking about. Um, it helps to have a sister. My sister is a professor at the University of Michigan, so that helps too. Ah, oh, totally. So so I'm talking to the homeowners and they're like, yeah, we we've sold the house. We're moving out. Um, so if you're going to make this happen, like it's got to happen, you know, in the next like four or five days. Oh. So I got one like grad student from this smaller college schoolcraft to come with me and see these pencils and was documenting it. And 
he went back and told the chair, like, you've got to come and see this. It's absolutely amazing. And we went back to the house, I think probably about a week and a half later and the house was locked and the couple had moved out. So I was like, well, I'll just, that table can't be moved out of this house. So I'll just wait until the next people buy the house and, and, and do this all over again. And the people who bought the house, uh, tore the walls out, tore the dolls down, smashed the table apart, threw oh. everything. Like it's all, all gone. The whole house has been re-renovated. Oh. It's like property brothers came in and just smashed everything. So oh. those are the only two instances when I had reproducible phenomena. And in both cases, the universe fought me on it and wouldn't allow, I mean, one college undergrad student to see it. And that's so, I mean, so, yeah. So Why here's where we get at- into the nitty gritty, right? When you're like the, the universe wouldn't let anybody else see it. Or do you think there's a sentience there that's a part of that, that I don't, it's hard not to get conspiratorial, especially when that house burnt down. I mean, look, you can, you know, put it up to happenstance. Sure. But I don't know, man, it feels just like, and like even you said, maybe the universe knew that the house was going to be sold, torn apart, and that nobody would ever get in to actually study it uh, repeatably, verifiably. You know what I mean? It's like, again, you know, it's that trickster element. At the at the point that I'm at now, I'll be 50 this year, and I've been doing this for 30 years. And, and the way that I currently think about stuff, I really do have this idea that, you know, you always hear people talk about, like, the universe is all one thing like we're all just one thing right Uh, and i really do feel like whatever experiences i have or you have whatever like it's it's the it's me it's the i am the universe if we're all one thing it's Mm -hmm. just me like playing with me wow like i'm driving myself nuts like it's it's like oh look at what i'm going to give you it's you know, me talking to you, you're just me in disguise and, and you're leading me on this path. And I feel like the phenomena is that way, too. It's just me in a in a, an alternate realm fucking with me. <laughs> I love that. <sighs> you're such a bastard to yourself, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think but it's, it's what we all do to ourselves, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I think that a lot of times can account for like synchronicities and coincidences too. Like, you know, you're going to be there. So why wouldn't you go and fuck with yourself and keep yourself on the path of weirdness? I've had this thought too. It's the same sort of idea as if, uh, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear, it doesn't make a sound. If, if I close my eyes and ears and all my senses off to the world, do any of you really exist? (laughs) You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I still exist. No, Riley, no. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, though. If I had a table that made magic pencils, there is no way I would give that up. Why like, are you selling that? Was a, why are you yeah. selling that house? And then why are you also not using that as a feature to the future buyer? Be like, by the way, uh, right? this <laughs> this table makes pencils. Yeah, or Paranormal Pencil Company. You could sell those for oh, top dollar. I mean, seriously. What happened right? to the pencils? Come on. Uh, I have a, a whole glass full of them still. So yeah. I have I have some of them. But, and you know, the other thing is, too, is like, again, you say, like, why would people sell that house? Like, that was right at that time period, right before the market crashed, when houses mm-hmm. were just, like, selling for, like, tons of money right before the market bottomed out. And, you know, they wanted to get out, and they did. They, they had perfect time like they got out and then someone like i said someone bought that house for pennies on the dollar and then just destroyed it like ripped it apart and and redid it all modern it looks terrible now i I think you could make more money with a magic table that's all i'm saying does Um, does the strange energy lie within the house or the table or the people that reside in it in other words is there still an energy in that new space or is it completely evaporated do you think no the last time i was there which was many years ago like it was the table for sure. Wow. Like something something was up with that table because I moved that table around that room like it was huge, but you know, the owner and I pushed it to each side and you know, we flipped it upside down. Obviously no pencils fell out of it when it was upside down. That would, they'd have to hit the ceiling, but which would have been great too. Like <laughs> a pencil shoot out from nowhere and launch itself into the ceiling. <laughs> but uh yeah, it was the something about the table. Where was the table from? Like, how old was the table? 
the table was original to the house. So the house was built in 1901. And like I said, it was a very missiony arts and Detroit was a big arts and crafts uh, mm-hmm. area at the time. So everything was quarter sawn oak and hardwood. And there were a lot of artistic kind of communes around the area. So everything was handcrafted and handmade. So I, I would imagine, you know, it was just handcrafted by some artisan in the area. I have, no, I have a question for you. No, hold on real quick. No, like sigils or any weird inscriptions. Like you didn't get a sense that like somebody was like purposely making a magic table. No, not at all. Okay. But, you know, I will tell you almost slightly related um, years ago, I had a case where a husband and wife in Rochester, Michigan, uh, they thought their garage was haunted. Whenever they would go in their garage, they would get these like really crazy experiences of overwhelming dread. So I went out there and researched the land, researched the property. There was absolutely nothing strange had ever happened there. No cemeteries, nobody had ever died, no fires, no, no nothing. And I'm in the garage and I was... I asked them if I could smoke in the garage. They said, yes. So I was leaning there smoking, trying to think of what was happening. And as I was smoking, like I started to get real agitated and real mad. And the clients came out and they're like, how you doing? And I yelled at the clients. It was so out of character for myself. I'm like, oh, so this is what they're experiencing. Like they're experiencing this aggression. Mm. And I noticed that it was only when I was touching the garage. So I was like, who built this garage? So I went on this months long track talking to the builder and where the building supply had come from. And I found out that that garage had been built with reclaimed wood from a mental asylum. Mm. Holy shit. Oh, whoa. Careful where you get your wood. Seriously. <laughs> so I like have this idea in my head, like whether it's the table or the garage, like that these things hold something mm. that they have some kind of memory or purpose. I mean, the the question I was going to ask you, and I've always sort of been, I guess, fascinated might be the word about the idea of these aporting objects, objects materializing out of nowhere. And you read a lot about them in the old spirit sessions that took place uh, at, at the turn of the century and stuff like that, or even uh, yogis and, and, and holy men being able to manifest objects. And before I was always skeptical, I guess might be the word, but now that you've experienced it yourself, I mean... Do you look back at a lot of those cases and go, oh, my – in other words, did you ever question the ability of aportation before and and now do you have a different I, you know, idea Bryce, around it? I, I, I love it when you start talking like Ray Stans. It's it really is great. Like when you're just like <laughs> when you do, when you go straight up Dan Aykroyd from Ghostbusters, it's like the best <laughs> thing ever. I, I really do. I mean, you know, one of those things – as a person who studies strangeness is I was always fascinated with spiritualism and, and how they were hoaxing ectoplasm and right. how they, how, how they were making trumpets float and luminescent hands and all of that stuff and how they were having aborting objects. And I always felt in the back of my mind, you know, that was probably just some kind of trick. I, I knew that sometimes in, you know, one of the things that they would do in seance, seance parlors, is they would hide stuff on the top blade of a ceiling fan and knowing Sorry. that at some point knowing at some point it would flip off and hit a wall and oh there's your reporting object you know so like i knew that it could be done and that people learned to you know flip coins with their toes like just crazy stuff to get this to happen yeah but over the years i mean i've experienced reporting objects aside from the pencils and stuff we were i was filming an episode of paranormal lockdown with nick groff and katrina weidman and we were in uh, franklin castle in ohio and as we were walking around like right in front of me uh like this flash goes right before my eyes and i i hear it hit the ground and i look down and there's a, a buffalo head nickel oh. and it just came out of nowhere in this abandoned old house wow and, and i picked it up and and everybody was freaking out and i it's, it's, it's crazy when you're filming, you know, this like from filming television shows, Bryce, like it's crazy that that doesn't make the cut. Right. Like, I like don't here know I am, that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm here. I am holding an object that came out of nowhere and somewhere a producer is like, yeah, that's not scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculous. That that's ridiculous. 
Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to switch tracks a little bit, but we're going to keep it weird with John E.L. Tenney. Uh, We'll be right back with this week's story, or shall I say topic of high strangeness. Before we get into this week's story of high strangeness, I did have one. I, I can't get over these pencils. I have one more question. You say they're normal. Have you have you brought any of those pencils in for like lab analysis anywhere? Or yeah, uh, run them run them by your EMF meter. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the problem is I have I've taken them places for people to look at, but right. I don't have the money to do actual chemical and spectral analysis of these That's pencils. What we keep and, forgetting is it takes money to do time, money, effort, right? Lab yeah. reports. Uh, it's not free. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And the thing that cracks me up the most is uh, I was going over this case with a friend of mine who's a a researcher of strange stuff, Brian, and he was laughing because he goes, this is such a weird, strange, amazing kind of case. But what the fuck does it even matter? Like, it's just pencils falling out of a table. Like, what is it? It doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that there's life after death or aliens or monsters. It just proves that pe- these pencils appear out of nowhere. Like, what does that mean in the overall scheme of things? Nothing. And he was, it, and it, it is really ridiculous. Right. It just, right. it There's just proves that we good. really are in a Pixar film and it's just some sight gag, you know, that they keep cut that, that like the movie keeps cutting away to. <laughs> We're just yeah. there to react I like, to this stuff. I still like this idea of like, you know, things go missing around your house all the time and you're, and you know, how many people said, oh, it's the, you know, the little goblins. They like to take things and maybe they're like, OK, we take a lot of shit. We need somewhere to put it. <laughs> this table will work nicely. Magic table. Yeah. That's the- but then they're just spitting it out in this couple's house outside of Detroit. It's not like well, anything fun is happening with the pencils. Everything- but does that mean that there are like these uh, lost object portals all over yes. the world that uh, we're just yes. not paying attention to? Yes. I think so. I think that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, like all somewhere, your, like, whenever you hear like about like gnomes and elves who have these like huge caverns full of treasure, is it because all of your lost change goes to one cave? Yeah, Whoa. there's there's like a there's a house in Spokane, Washington that has a lazy boy that shoots out old socks. <laughs> Every time you recline, just socks fall out of it from your dryer. Oh, oh, don't mind good. the socks now. Ah, uh, it's like a tube system too. There's somebody who's got a you know yeah, pneumatic tubes. blueprints. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't know. We can shoot this somewhere out on the east coast, but n- nowhere past the delta. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's like some weird like uh, you know afterlife bureaucratic job where you just work in the the pencil dimension <laughs> transport factory, <laughs> just loading pencils into tubes for eternity. <laughs> He just the guy just hates it and he has to do it forever. <laughs> yeah, forever. <laughs> Somebody please buy this house and destroy this fucking table. <laughs> Free me of my chair. I don't work when people are watching me. Do not look at me do this. I can't do this if you're watching me. What's what's even better is it's that guy's job and that guy's job in an alternate dimension to make sure that pencils don't get lost, but he's become so bored with the job he's like i'm just gonna route him under that table to Detroit. <laughs> that sounds more realistic yeah. to be honest yeah, yeah. Fuck it. Uh, <laughs> all right well it is wet hot alien summer two summer abduction and we are in the thick of it right now we have done what do we do we did the 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 mass cor- the coronado mass abduction event yeah and uh i've really been in the world of alien grays and we're gearing up for another deep dive that's going to stick with these guys so i thought it would be good to kind of like pause in between big stories and take a look at these entities and talk about these entities uh, because we haven't ever really done them before. You know, we've only, they've been in some of the stories that we've done. So tonight we've invited John to discuss with us the greys. Yeah. Great. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. The classic great alien contact or experience is extreme terror. I can relate to that in a way. It's a very cold, mechanical kind of computer-like intelligence. It's what we perceive as artificial because it's not incarnated and it never was. So it doesn't have any empathy or doesn't relate to that at all. This quote comes from director and magic practitioner Brian Butler during a 2012 interview with Vice reporter Liz Armstrong about his experience contacting what he calls 
extra dimensional entities typically referred to as the Greys. He goes on to say, It's eternal, it's ancient, and it's also futuristic. It's from a dimension that's beyond what our perception of time is, too. So not only is it not a warm-blooded creature, it's also transcending the barriers of time and space. There are certain limitations you need to function in the world, such as a body. It's So it's impossible for a human being to fully comprehend what it, it could be, just by nature of being alive. If you don't retain those things, such as an ego or sense of logic and reason, then you can't function in society. These entities operate outside of those rules, so it's very difficult to classify them. We can see a small part of them, but the whole thing is too much. It's overwhelming. It helps you to evolve, and it is all, and it also can be terrifying, the vastness of where they're coming from. And just do where, where do the greys come from? We've encountered these iconic alien be- beings in so many stories here on the BCC, from Roswell to Betty Barney Hill to our recent deep dive on the Coronado mass abduction event. Hell, I even kicked off my share of the podcast recounting the time my dogs and I saw something I would describe as an alien gray peering into my living room window at 4 a.m. one early June morning. And yet we've never devoted a segment of high strangeness solely to these entities. Are they from outer space? The inner mind, the space between spaces, as John Hurt's character in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Professor Harold Oxley so elegantly put it. Are the greys aliens or demons or something else? Or are they all of the above? Perhaps tonight's guest can lead us to some enlightenment on the subject. But before we dive into that discussion, I wanted to present a brief history of alien greys. And I will try to keep this short, Uh, but here we go. Alien greys are typically described as being three and a half to five feet tall with thin androgynous bodies, spindly arms and legs with four fingers on each hand, commonly described as being webbed. Their skin is sometimes described as slightly reptilian in nature. Their oversized heads bug-like with pointed chins, narrow slits for nostrils, a thin lipless mouth, which may or may not open to reveal a pocket. And of course, no portrait of a gray would be complete without its signature black almond-shaped eyes. Oh yeah, and they are gray, or occasionally wear tight gray bodysuits. They have also been described as having more of a pinkish gray earthly color to them. These childlike nightmare makers show up during UFO encounters and in abduction stories, appearing out of thin air or through, like a pencil, or through bright lights in a victim's bedroom late at night or in the wee hours of the morning. The abductee often, but not always, describes being paralyzed and levitated from their bed, taken aboard a ship where the greys perform uncomfortable and terrifying experiments on them, seemingly for the purpose of harvesting DNA or reproductive materials for some sort of alien-human hybrid situation. Greys are often referred to as being cold and emotionless, although at times they've been known to reassure the experiencer with a telepathic message, something like, don't worry. This will be all over soon. (laughs) Greys have the ability to erase people's minds, blocking their memory banks from the trauma of their abduction experience. Although, as we've learned, nothing stays buried forever. Often, they will send an abductee back to bed with a little souvenir from their trip around a spaceship, a tiny metallic implant hidden somewhere in their body. But where do the alien greys come from? Before there was Betty and Barney Hill, there was H.G. Wells. In Wells' 1893 article, Man of the Year Million, Wells predicted that, a human, that the human race would evolve into short, large-headed gray beings with enlarged eyes. A couple years earlier, a book called Meta, A Tale of the Future, introduced readers to a race of gray-skinned, futuristic aliens with big heads. Hmm. A 1933 Swedish children's book by Gustav Sandgren called... The Hidden Danger continued the budding existence of greys in pop culture with the description of these beings as... Bryce, I I sent you a quote. I forgot to tell you. Yes. Okay, great. Here we go. go. The creatures did not resemble any race of humans. They were short, and their heads were big and bald with strong, square foreheads and very small noses and mouths and weak chins. What was most extraordinary about them were the eyes 
large, dark, gleaming with a sharp gaze. They wore clothes made of soft gray fabric, and their limbs seemed to be similar to those of humans. Sounds like a classic gray to me. Yeah, so far, I'd say. Yeah, right? But we're just kind of dealing with grays in fiction. So who was the first person to actually contact a gray? Some say that person was none other than infamous British occultist Alistair Crowley. Yes, in 1917, Crowley was living in New York City and conducting a series of magical experiments to contact extra-dimensional intelligence through a r- ritual known as the uh, Amal- uh, Amalantra working. Sorry, I fucked this up. The Amalantra working. There you go. Landed it. Nice, Michael. (laughs) Basically, it's rumored that Crowley managed to open up a portal where he made contact with an an entity he referred to as LAM, L-A-M, all capitals. Crowley drew an illustration of LAM, and it's been debated whether the drawing is of an extraterrestrial entity or a self-portrait of Crowley himself in the astral plane. But it's, it's undeniable it shares an eerie resemblance to what we call grays today. Wouldn't it be wild if Crowley opened a portal to the Gray's dimension, allowing them access to Earth and occasionally crash landing in the New Mexican desert like they did outside of Roswell, New Mexico in 1947? Mm -hmm. Because that's the next major place the Gray's quote-unquote show up until Betty and Barney Hill's abduction experience in 1961, which really began to establish their whole oeuvre in the 20th century pop culture and ufology. Skeptics have noted that before the Hill abduction, there was an episode of Outer Limits uh, just a few days before Betty and Barty Hill were taken, featuring alien creatures that have a passing resemblance to the Greys. However, Betty recalled under hypnosis, asking her captors to draw a map of where they were from, and the star chart Betty was allegedly presented uh, resembled the star system Zeta Reticuli. Therefore, the Greys are commonly referred to as Zeta Reticulans. The next major abduction case that really spread the image of the Greys far and wide, mostly in due to the illustration on the cover of its dust jacket, was Communion by Whitley Strieber, who wrote of his experiences of being abducted by alien Greys from his Catskills cabin in the early 80s. Were these the same Zeta Reticulants that kidnapped Betty and Barney Hill or crashed at Roswell? The theories are endless as to who or what these little guys actually are. In fact, it's possible that there may be different types of greys. I'm sure you've heard us talk about tall greys as well as little greys. Well, what about renegade greys from Zeta Reticuli that have been genetically altered by the tyrannical reptilian Orient Empire? Renegade that's greys, that's good. I'm writing that down. <laughs> Made the that's list. the explanation put forth by author Craig Campobasso in his book, The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. These are bad greys that have been genetically altered by reptilian aliens called draconians and are not the enlightened telepathic good greys of Zeta Reticuli that are fighting against the influences of the evil Oran Empire along with the Galactarian alignment of space peoples and planets. And both versions of greys have the ability to face through solid objects like walls and doors and both versions will abduct you, but the good ones are just slightly nicer about it. And I didn't even really talk about the tall greys and the even taller greys. Yes, there are two types of tall greys, tall and extra tall. <laughs> Although the Fox Mulder heyday of alien abduction cases seems to have come and gone with the 1990s, could be up for debate, the image of the grey alien has never been more iconoclastic than it is in 2021. We see it everywhere, on stickers and skateboards, as characters in mainstream movies and cartoons, and as mascots on 420 novelty mugs. Hell, drive through Nevada and almost every truck stop you'll pass is selling alien beef jerky with a smiling alien gray face slapped on the wrapper. Whether they may be us from the future, interdimensional demons, or aliens from Zeta Reticuli, this phenomena is physically manifesting itself in our reality. It is possibly real and extremely deeply integrated into folklore, mass culture, and our psyches. At this point, I'm going to release the yoke of this Galactarian scout ship and hand the reins over to our guest, Johnny L. Tenney, and ask him, John, what the hell are the Greys? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. That's They are immensely strange, and you did a great job of putting how much 
how diverse everything is with the Greys too. Um, Thank you. It's it, it really is amazing to me how it the Greys caught fire so fast. Especially you know I really started off in the late eighties and early nineties, and that's when Greys really had their heyday. Uh, it was just everywhere. The Schwa Corporation. Uh, that's when all the belt buckles and stickers and skate zines and everything just started putting alien heads on everything. Mm. Yeah. And for me, it was interesting as a researcher of, of odd stuff because I do. I am very interested in in the kind of folkloric nature of things and how fiction can alter what seems to be our shared reality. And I've always been a big science fiction person. And so the alien gray never really scared me or seemed weird to me. It always seemed like an extension of things that I had been reading about in comic books and in science fiction books my whole life. That's funny because I remember the first time I ever saw the image of a gray and it was on the cover of communion at like Walden books or B Dalton at, at Oak park mall. And I remember taking one look at that thing and just like it felt like a, a knife made of ice, like cut yeah. my my spine, like it just terrified me to the bone. And then it wasn't long after that, that sightings became popular and they were doing all these stories where they would show like hand drawn images of the grays. And I was like, yep, no, nope, I know like, no, 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 no. Like it re- really scared me. And yeah, maybe that I was just, I wasn't exposed to that stuff yet, you know? I don't know. Well, I can tell you in the early 90s when I was doing research for Unsolved Mysteries, we reached this point where we had all of these gray alien abduction stories, and we were also getting a lot of my son or daughter or wife or whoever was possessed story. And as a researcher, I'm looking at like, okay, so she's in bed and paralyzed and there's this thing in the room and it's floating her. And I got to this point, I'm like, am I reading a possession story? Or am I reading an alien abduction story? Like, mm. how are we portraying this? Are we going to show what she saw? Because she said that she saw an illuminated demon, but it, did she see a gray? Did she see an alien? Like we're going by her perception of reality like, should we try and tell this story multifaceted as if we don't know like what it is? Of course, that was too deep for Unsolved Mysteries. They were like, no, we're going to do this as a possession or no, we're going to do this as an alien abduction. But even as early as then, like my mind was already expanding to the point of like, oh, so we're simply drawing on the experiencer's experience and what their religious, spiritual, non-spiritual, agnostic belief is and going to say these are different when they might just be the same thing Hmm. right right because there are people who believe that the greys are i mean there's like entire books written about it that the greys are angels yeah yeah demons you know or yeah exactly fallen angels yeah and what's interesting too is if you talk to people who experiencers who have encountered and actually been able to either converse or have some kind of interaction with their grays um the thing that i find really interesting is that they can drive them away with uh in if like invoking jesus right right well so strange it comes up in a lot of this research that i was doing that like the way to protect yourself is to picture like it's kind of like you hear in like uh relaxation technique stuff where you're like picturing or when you're like protecting yourself against like ghosts or demons, like this idea of like projecting a big wall of light or imagining literally like, this actually follows up exactly what you said, John, like picturing the, the, the archangel Michael, you know, like blocking you and like, that's a way to protect yourself against attacks or abductions by alien grace. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and you have to wonder, like, is that, repellent to the grays or is it because it's reinforcing your own faith in in something you know what i mean like is it right. is it repellent to them or is it just empowering to you man i mean i've always i've always vibed with this sort of pet theory that you know creatures like bigfoot and the alien gray are these archetypal images 
one sprouting forward in our timeline and one sprouting backwards in our timeline. And we as the human, you know, homo sapiens sapiens right now are, are caught in the middle, right? And, and one seems to be our future and the other seems to be our past. And there's, you know, we manifest them through our unconscious psyche, perhaps as an individual or even more so as a collective. But I don't know, there was always... There, that always seemed to make sense to me, like strong, hairy, living in the woods off the land and moving into cities and then off into space and our brains get bigger, our mouths get smaller, our we, we lose our penises. <laughs> so I, I don't well, know. We're, not, we're being clones. They're clones. If you don't, right, you know, right. you don't, you don't have your belly button, you don't have reproductive uh, organs. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, that's on. that's just like on an unconscious Jung level. I also have no problem with, you know, Bigfoot being an interdimensional being all on its own and an alien gray being an interdimensional being all on its own. I, I don't yeah, know. I think, I, I think the universe is weird enough to, I mean, I, I've talked about this a lot, probably with you guys too. Like I, my, my point of view is the universe is, is endless and boundless and endlessly creative. Right. And so for all of those things to exist simultaneously, I have no problem with the idea that there is a, humanoid Bigfoot and there is an alien Bigfoot and there is an interdimensional Bigfoot and they are all coexisting or co non-existing or co-consciously existing at the same time. I think I the universe that. is like, let's, let's give you everything. Let's, let's do it all at once. That's so great. I love that. You know, how, how much I get, I guess, how much weight do you put into the power of a guy like Crowley's manifestations? I mean, we've seen the power of occult manifestation and guys like L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons. But when it comes to the, the OG Alistair Crowley, like, you know, could he have, could he have done like what Michael said in his, uh, in his tale of high strangeness, could he have opened up a portal to these, to these gray beings? I mean, again, I'm allowing for any and all possibilities yeah. so I can say yes, but with the old crow himself, like, when I look at pictures of Lamb, when I look at his picture of the, the being that people show, like, oh, he channeled some kind of gray, he channeled a space alien. Like, the, as a researcher, the thing that I I think about often is, like, okay, you know, the name Lamb that he named it is a name given to the root chakra, mm. right? So it's, it's your base chakra that controls your sexual energies. Wow. And if you really look at that picture of lamb, like it looks like a penis tip going into a vagina. Yeah, wow. I'm looking at it right now. I'm and Googling you are now. 100% yeah, I can just correct. hear people pulling over in their cars like, <laughs> oh, it's not titillating, guys. So just keep, keep driving. Uh, keep heading. You know, to to play, you can you can look Look, at it. I mean, it literally looks like the underside of a male penis going into a vagina. Oh my god! And then he drew some eyes on the glands on on the underneath of the penis. Like, yeah, so wild. Almost, it's like the it's like that the that Virgin Mary motif is really just a vulva and vagina. You know, the Fatima and. Yeah, yeah, for yes. sure. Yes, because you're it's you're, all you're comes back to the penis. You're the praying to the Everything. source of of life, but uh, <laughs> so this is great because and then also I think like lamb is associated with um oh this is getting into like old magical languages and old language old world languages, but like also the way or the path yeah. also, which would kind of like okay I can line that up with like the path yeah, the root being a the root the thing. origin yep. I'll never look um, at that picture the same way again. That is so. <laughs> but so does you know that what? mean that alien grays are just upside down dicks w- w- in walking around vaginas, walking vaginas? I mean, maybe that was just. I mean, you know, you, you never know with 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 Alistair, like what he was trying to get across, what message he was trying to get across. Maybe he did it, it invoke some kind of extraterrestrial or interdimensional force like again it's all on the table yeah but you at the two when you have to like this is my difficulty sometimes when i'm researching like i have to look at what was going on at the time and how old were people and so you know you were talking about hg wells talking about the man in a million years and when you start to look backwards at this period of time so 1900 when the century flipped i think alistair is is like 24 years old right and the newspapers are filled with stories about what is man going to be like in the future Mm -hmm. there's a, a a biology professor named henry bruner who wrote an article that was in the new york times 
and it was called um, The Future Man. And he draws a picture of someone with a giant head and big eyes and really soft proportioned body. Uh, there's another article in 1904 called What's the Matter with Martians? And it, it draws a spindly Some, yeah. body and, and a big head. And you have to remember, like, Aleister Crowley is like, again, he's like 25, 26 years old. And all of this stuff is going to his mind. Aside from all of the magic and occult stuff he's doing, he's also there for the birth of science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that even, I mean, like Superman, you know, which is a little bit later, you know, but uh, Siegel and Schuster were trying to sell Superman to newspaper strips for a while. And like the first incarnation of Superman was supposed to be this like futuristic master man that was more of a villain. He was actually more like Lex Luthor than he was Superman. But still, you know, Superman's called the man of tomorrow. So that all like, you know, it makes me think of like that we really were thinking about the future around that time. And that is, you know, that's where we get, you know, War of the Worlds is turn of the century. Uh, you know, uh, the the first is first man on the moon. Is that the name of the um, Wells book? But it but Jules it does, Verne. Ju- well, Jules Verne and then Wells also did something about creatures on the moon. So now I'm, I'm getting yeah, confused. Yeah. But um. But it is it is interesting, this whole idea of like just running with the sex thing. Right. Because the the thing that usually happens to people when they're brought up in a ship with greys is like some weird sexual experiment is performed right. on them. You know, sometimes like in the case uh, was that one from the 50s where the the farmer in Central America was like taken aboard and that like hot alien babe like mated with him Um you know, Villa Boas, yeah. yeah, thank you, Villa Boas. Um, There's this. Uh, I I wonder if we're looking at it from the way that if like, what if the Greys are somehow this r- physical manifestation of like all of our sexual anxieties as a planetary system? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if we think about sex as a magical act, which people who aren't even into the occult describe it as, yeah, it's the thing that creates <clears throat> life. People are just like. Uh, 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 the characters in uh, Days and Confused are saying all the time, they're just like, think about all the people out there just fucking right now. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a magical <laughs> act that's always taking place, right? So maybe we've all like conjured these living embodiments of like weird sexual anxiety. You know what I mean? Maybe that's what yeah, they for, are. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that being one aspect totally makes sense to me. And then I also think to myself, like, you know, when we talk about first ideas and original concepts, like why did science fiction burst forth at the same time all over the planet? Like why did everyone start writing science fiction stories all within 20 years of each other? Like, were we also being subtly influenced to push ourselves at the, at the beginning of the industrial revolution to go further and faster by some other entity or by some other force that like was trying to get us to progress on a path? Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fulfill our destiny. Yeah, absolutely. In a timely manner. Um, yeah. You know, speaking of of, uh, of those, uh, you know, just going off that, you know, the opposites in male and female and stuff, I was reading from um, Where the Footprints End, Volume 2, but there's a little section on John Mack, <clears throat> famed Harvard psychologist and UFO abduction researcher. Um, and it just states that, He evoked the concept of the reified metaphor, the notion that supernatural phenomena employ symbolic manifestations to impart their true intentions in our reality. In Mack's work, paranormal phenomena utilize symbolic presentations to convey their meaning, e.g. human-alien hybrids don't represent actual literal offspring, but rather a coincidentia oppositorium of union of opposites, which denizens of the other world wish to invoke. Um, I just love that. The idea that invoking this balance of opposites, the the black, the white, the yin and the yang, the male and the female, there's, there's such power in that, you know, and I don't know. There is, but also isn't it, sorry to jump on you. No, that's it. No, but but no, but this is part of me, but also aren't we living in a time right now where we're like, starting to wake up from thinking about things as binary. You know what I mean? And, and these entities are the variations of all these different grays or all these different aliens and all the weird shit. Like, 
like John, you're talking about like there can be Bigfoot that's that that's from the forest. There can also be Bigfoot from a spaceship or Bigfoot f- foot from another dimension. Like, yeah, maybe this is like all teaching us that there's such a broad spectrum of just everything. It's not just uh, the uh, opposites at being attracted or coming together to create one. You know, but. I don't know. Does that yeah, make? I, I mean, I love Mac's idea that well, and it's not just his, but the other people who have suggested that, you know, the the kind of archetypes and the 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 path that we need to be on has to reveal itself in even those strange ways that we might be able to understand it and perceive it. And so, when you look at something like greys and hybrid children and abductions and stuff like that, like the abductions are traumatic, and the Hybrid children is, you know, the union of this one thing and this other thing. Mm. But the lesson, too, about the greys is that the they're always kind of perceived as evil because they're all exactly the same. Right. Mm. You know, and so there's also this conscious idea that's set within you that like, but you don't want to get to this point. You don't want to get to the point where you're all exactly the same because you are unique and individual. Right. Mm. Wow. That's, that's, yeah, that that's makes great. so that gives, much sense. That gives me some chills. Um, and that reminds me of like Betty and Barney Hill's description of when they were looking at the craft from the ground and they could see the aliens walking around through the like windshield of the spacecraft on the deck, they were, they said that they moved clock. They, they moved kind of like a, like clockwork. And uh, Barney was like, these guys look like Nazis. Like they all seem very like, you know, they, they looked like they, 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 he's like, I've seen this and they, they act and behave like Nazis. And so that when I think of Nazis, I think of like one minded, you know, stormtroopers, you know what I mean? Just yeah. And, they, like, and Barney and Betty's aliens were wearing little uniforms too, right, little hats, right. and little right. uniforms. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. But you've said you mentioned last time on the show that you think that maybe that whole thing was a was like a government uh, MK Ultra early MK Ultra experiment, maybe. So who, maybe this all I mean, stuff I, all is, you know, human made as well. I don't know. I do think like, uh, you know, whether I don't be, you guys know this, I don't believe anything, but I have a lot of ideas right. on stuff. And I, I do think that you know, if there were contacts happening all over the planet, like let's say in the 1950s with the contactee movement, that yes, someone with money or power would want to be like, oh, how can we use this to our benefit? Can we reproduce this? Can we Mm. use this to our benefit? Uh, We probably can go to people who aren't so well educated and probably fool them with some technology that you know, they wouldn't even expect to have uh, whether that even be a helicopter or just some bright lights or a jet. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, people back in the 1950s, a lot of them weren't well read. They didn't have the Internet. They didn't know what was capable of, of the technology of the government back then. And so I think there probably were experiments that were done to see what would happen. I think it's Barney and Betty have always interested me because they're a mixed race couple. Um, it's there's a lot to Betty and Barney where I think maybe someone was trying something out with them. Mm. Wild. What do you say to people? uh, I mean, like yourself who have seen pencils fall out of underneath tables, like me who saw something like when I saw what I saw, uh, it seemed very tangible and very, very real. And my dogs were seeing it too. What do you say to the people who were like, no, 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 this wasn't a metaphor. This wasn't hallucination. This was an actual physical entity in my room. And I saw it just the way I'm looking at this glass of water. You know, so the, uh, what I tell them is, <laughs> so the, the last woman that I dated, uh, we had started dating and she told me, listen, you know, I don't want to be abducted by aliens and I don't want to see Bigfoot and I don't want ghosts in the house and stuff like that. And I said, well, you know, I'll do what I can, but no promises. <laughs> <laughs> Wear this necklace real quick. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we had been dating a couple months and, and she was dog sitting for a friend of hers. And she just asked me if I wanted to come over and dog sit with her and spend the night. And I said, yeah. So I went over and we were dog sitting and we went to bed that night and I woke up in fear like uh, there's no better way to kind of explain that like i just woke up in panic mode and i was sweating i was super hot 
And I didn't want to move. I didn't want to wake her up. And I didn't know if I was having an anxiety attack or a panic attack or something. But I could have sworn that there was a giant flash of light, which is what woke me up and scared me. I thought someone was in the room taking pictures. And I thought someone was still in the room hiding in the shadows. And so I very, without moving my head or anything, I just kind of turned my eyes toward her in the darkness. And she was awake too. And I said, did you see a flash of light? And she said, yes. Ugh. And I and I said, is someone in the room with us? And she said, I think so. <laughs> and then my heart started pounding and I just started getting like really scared. And I, I mean, I don't know if it's an intruder, or, but I've also got all this alien and UFO stuff in my mind from 30 years ago. Yeah. You know? And so I'm like, I, I told her, I just real quietly, I said, I'm just going to turn the light on. And I really quickly reached my hand over and turned the light on that was next to the bed and the room was empty and there was no one there obviously and we sat on the edge of the bed and she said i, th I think this relationship might be over because i think there was an alien in this room Whoa. wow oh. bummer we've got you yeah. again tenny <laughs> <laughs> you will never be in a relationship <laughs> other than ours <laughs> Well, but that's crazy because that's like how the, you know, uh, that was Coronado the, to a T. Yeah, Coronado, like they woke up in the Bang, hotel flash room light, because of a gone, flash of light shadow in that a room. caught their attention. And then shadows turns to aliens. Yeah. Yeah. And not to be and not to be too. Well, I don't have any secrets, so people should know that right off the bat. But um, the other thing that I started thinking about after that night, I mean, that. I, I didn't go back to sleep. I stayed awake. She went back to sleep, but I stayed awake. Yeah. And I, I was just sitting in the kitchen, in this strange kitchen of this person's house who I was dog sitting. And I was just formulating. And I realized, again, I don't have any secrets. I realized, like, how sexually charged that experience had also been, mm -hmm. like, that night. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was like, this is, that's really weird. Like, neither of us are really hypersexual like that, but we were that night. What? Mm -hmm. And then that started like feeding into my brain of like, was something elevating like the chemicals in our brain? Like, I, I don't know. It's just, it was, it's still well, very, very, sure. and she won't, I, I, I'm still friends with her, but she refuses to talk about it. Wow. It well, and it makes you to wonder too, charge, since that was it? neither, yeah, well, neither one of your houses either, that the house didn't belong to either one of you, that I wonder if other stuff's gone in and that, gone on in that house. Yeah, I don't know. I never brought it up to the people. She never talked about it. Um, yeah, That's I mean, and the other the other thing that I thought was strange too was that uh, when I when she went back to sleep and I got up, the the dog was in the living room just sound asleep. So the dog had no reaction to anything that was going on in that room. Hmm. It's strange, you know, when you hear these stories like the Coronado event and all this stuff where these entities are just walking through solid doors, you know. The grays really do at a certain point become interchangeable with with ghosts, you know, for sure. And, you know, there is a part of me as a researcher, like I can't help but think that some of some of the experiences might be, you know, leftover kind of genetic memory. I, I, I spent a lot of time up in the woods growing up at my parents cabin in northern Michigan and you know, when I read about greys and I read about alien abductions, I try and look at it through a natural lens of the world. And I've seen enough owls swoop out of the night and grab tiny mice mm. and disappear into the darkness to think to myself, is there a part of my brain that remembers being a mouse and these dark eyes silently coming out of the night and grabbing me and taking me up into the heavens? Yes. Like, mm. is that, is that a part of it too? Mm, fucking yes. That's a myth. Yes. Or I, I, I do believe we hold that. I, I, I do believe our DNA can pass on experiential memory. Absolutely. And, and, or have we gotten so big for our britches, the human race on this planet that our psyches have to create an apex predator, you know, to keep yeah. in our minds to keep our like bodies and reptilian brain like functioning. You know what I mean? Like, does it does it in a way keep us driven? You know what I mean? To know that there's still sure. something out there that could that could come get us, you know? Yeah, that motivates us to keep going. I'll tell you another. Uh, I've got 
uh, if you've got time for this. Yes, yes, yes. Some super high strangeness. So um, I have, over the years, my friends, we call it the force field. I have a force field over my house because I go to so many screwed up locations. I don't want ghosts and entities following me home. So I'm always safe in my house. So I have this, what I call a force field over my house. Keeps all the bad stuff out. Um, so I was really tired going through some, some some stuff last year and not sleeping very well. And I, I had this waking dream. I was My bedroom's on the second floor and I was laying in bed kind of watching television. I did that thing where I fell asleep but didn't know I was asleep. And I heard someone knocking on my window on the second floor. Oof. So I, I get up not really knowing I'm asleep. And I get up and I, and I walk over to the window and I peel the curtain back. And sitting on the roof of my house, knocking on my window, I don't know if you guys know, uh, have you guys ever discussed the uh, the Saucerian and Gray Barker, the Silver Bridge, Mothman, Gray Barker? Uh, yeah. Barker's come up. The We've done we've done uh, Mothman, and we've talked about it, the Mothman prophecies. We haven't really dug too deeply into Gray Barker. Uh, okay, so well, anyway, in, in my dream, he's on my roof. <laughs> This is the guy wow. who wrote they knew too much about flying saucers, right? And yeah, um, and yeah, yeah, and the the book The Silver Bridge, which was yes. the Mothman yeah. first kind of book. So anyway, I I see Gray out on my roof and I kind of laugh and I'm like, Gray, what are you doing out there? And he starts laughing. He's got this big wide tie on his stupid glasses, and and he goes, uh, I won. And I go, what do you mean you won? And I'm fully like the most realized awake dream. Like this is, it's just blowing my mind. And I, I think at this point I'm starting to realize I might be asleep. Mm-hmm. And I go, Gray, what do you mean you won? And he starts laughing and he floats backwards off of my roof. And I'm watching him disappear up into the sky. And he's laughing and he's going, I won, I won. And I scream through my window. I go, what do you mean you won? And right before he vanishes into the sky, he goes, John, the aliens, they're all named after me. (laughs) Oh, dude. (laughs) That That just just... gave me the worst fucking goosebumps ever. (laughs) I hate and love that story. (laughs) Well, it freaked me me out. And then in my my head, right before you said it, I was like, oh, Gray, Gray's, the Gray's, Gray Barker. And then then you said it. And and it's not Gray's, it's Gray's with an apostrophe. Whoa, yeah. It's Gray's aliens, not Gray aliens. And when we call them Gray's, we're legitimately saying they're his. Wow. That's Oh. Whoa. Yes. It's gonna take me yes. some time to process yes. all so that. That really kind of fucked me up. <laughs> Because the other thing is, too, is I obviously I've done this for a long time and I never put it together that his name is Gray and he's a guy who writes about aliens. Yeah. That's so weird. That's so weird. That's yeah, that's very strange. Love it. So maybe instead of the Formanots, it should be the Johnanots. Yes. <laughs> the Tenny Nuts. They're mine. They're mine now. <laughs> I don't want them. Trust me. <laughs> I mean, I'll hang out with them and maybe drink a, uh, have a vodka or something, but yeah, I don't, I don't need them around my house. Some Copy future paranormal that. researcher is going to wake up in a dream one day with you knocking on their window. Yeah, I can only hope. That would be <laughs> rad. That would be rad. Well, John, uh, amazing, uh, amazing guest as always. It's so great to have you on the show. Uh, this should be more than an annual event. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for five more minutes. Oh please, please, oh, yeah. yeah. So I yeah, I, I know you were world, uh, traveling, man. so I didn't want to I didn't want to take your time. Yes, Riley, do you do you think you can play that MP3 that I sent you? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I'll set this up before you play it. Uh, I did a, I researched a case with a husband and wife who said they were being abducted by Greys, and went round and round with them, investigated them as much as I could, and during. I don't know how well this is going to sound. It was recorded off of a, an old style answering machine. But during their abduction, the husband reached over and pressed the record button on their answering machine. Oh, my God. Whoa. And so the what the sound you're going to hear, uh, according to them, you'll hear her and him talking uh, while you hear a whooshing sound, which is the ship slash 
portal that has opened up in their room, and then you'll hear the wife scream before the right before the tape ends. Shut up! Oh my god! All right, all right. Let me grab a protective crystal before I listen to this. <laughs> Yeah, everyone imagine light pyramids. <laughs> well, grab right, a, grab the Archangel Michael and sit him right on your lap. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> oh, wow. That's insane. So if, if, if that's what it claims to be, that you've just heard people being abducted. Yikes. That is, that really is insane. So did he start pl- recording because he had a sense that it was coming or it had already started? So they were, they both, the, the wife would wake up first in all the situations mm. and alert him that something was happening. And in this instance, this is, I had been researching with them and I told them like, you know, if you can ever do anything and get some proof his in his mind. Yeah. In his mind, it was, you know, the answering machines right there next to the bed, just hit the record button. And so while this was happening, he hit the record button and got that, that sound on there. That is insane. I mean, how many, how many abduction stories do you read where, they're like, I need to grab something. I need to take something. I, ne- you know what I mean. I need to bring something back. That's that's. I've never heard of somebody th- being quick enough to think, oh shit, just hit the fucking record button. Yeah, this yeah. is why we it. we need analog equipment next to our beds at all times. Because if I if time. I like the steps I would have to go through to unlock my phone and find my camera and get the camera ready or the audio <laughs> like the recorder ready, would, my like. <laughs> My head would all uh, would already Chicago, be on a chihuahua's weather. body. <laughs> yeah. well, no, you know, for, no. for, for years, I kept a dream diary next to my bed, and I'd wake up and write down my my dreams. Uh, but over the past few years, I keep a instant press digital recorder next to my bed, and all I have to do is reach over and grab it and hit record, and then start talking. And I'll tell you what: if you've never recorded yourself talking straight out of a dream and then falling back asleep and listening to it the next morning it's pretty fucked up oh like, man <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't really remember what you said and it's all bizarre dream language I, and dream words it's it's pretty great i always That's hated great. writing in my dream journal because i i couldn't keep up fast enough the you know what i mean yeah. it's so visual and i'm just trying to like pro- translate it into fucking words and it never worked and i was like i you're that's so smart yeah but, but it's crazy too, right? Wait, when you read your dream diary, though, it like even no though sense. it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't read right. But in your brain, you can see it the way it happened in the dream. Yeah, it's yeah. a different, it's a different form altogether. That happened to me recently. I heard like a, I was like hearing a song in my dream, and I wanted to record the melody of it. So like, I woke up and I instantly started recording my voice on uh on my on my like you know voice memo app, but. Try singing at five forty-five in the morning. It's not. It sounds really bad. I had I had a dream many years ago that I was on a stage in front of like a hundred thousand people, and I had written the greatest song in history. And I I woke up and I like I had written down. I wrote woke up and I wrote down the lyrics, and then fell back asleep. And I woke up in the morning and I had to go to work. And I was at work and I was like, oh shit. I wrote down that most popular, famous song in the world, the one that's going to make me famous. I got to get home. I got to like look at the lyrics and remember it because I can't remember the song. And I went home and looked in my dream book, and it was the lyrics to Karma Chameleon, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> that checks out. <laughs> that is so awesome. <laughs> On that note, man, yeah. John, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for illuminating our podcast, man. You are just the best. We- no, thanks for having me. I always have so much fun. John, we don't know where to find the Karma Chameleon, but where can our uh, listeners find you? Uh, I've tried to make everything as simple as possible. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook is all John E.L. Tenney, or they can just type Tenney, T-E-N-N-E-Y, weirdo, into Google and follow it wherever it goes. There you go. And we'll throw your uh, website and stuff up on the show notes of this episode. Uh, Boys, anything to plug? I feel like I had something and now I can't remember what it is. But uh, guys, what do you got? 
Grace has another new single out. Uh, it's called Trist, and it is great. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. And yeah. you're shooting a video for it, too, right? We're shooting a video for it? Yeah, that's coming, too. More it's, Grace uh, and Riley. More Grace yeah. and Riley. It's coming. And, you know, if you haven't seen the Mango video, check that one cool. out, too. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's say uh, good night And go get regressed. Thanks again, John. Thanks, Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock multiple reward episodes every month.